he doesn't need a lot of introduction, but uh, I asked uh, his friend for many years, uh, Sasha Masha, uh, to say some few words, funny uh -huh. things about Warren Watson. Uh -huh. So let's have a It's really unnecessary to introduce Warren in this building, the same as in building 22, when we are all came from many years ago. So. As far as I remember, Warren came from getting education, Caltech, MIT, and uh, then uh, working in San Diego and CAR, and finally he is with Goddard for more than 20, 25 years, I believe. Right, Warren? Yeah, I was here originally, and then they built the center around me, so. <laughs> yes, yeah, and uh, so many of us attended Warren's climate lecture series in <coughs> building 34. And uh, Exoplanet, as far as I know, it's a new Warren's interest. And everything what Warren touches kind of blows up. And, and uh, it will be an enjoyable hour. OK. The subject of exoplanets, well, this talk is partly to get people interested in this building in the subject because there is a movement afoot to build a bridge between buildings 33 and 34 in this subject area. Uh, I'm the co-PI with uh, a space scientist, Jeremy Schnittman, on an exoplanet science task group. And one of our jobs has been to bring the two buildings together and try to learn to speak a common language about exoplanets. And along those lines, I'm also giving climate talks over in Building 34. I have one at 2 o'clock today, so it's my first double header since I entered this business. Um, anyway, uh, exoplanets, they are extremely exciting. It's really one of the hottest new areas in science as a whole, much less NASA. Uh, and so artists have flocked to the field. You see these kinds of beautiful images, all of the artists' fantastic imaginings of exoplanets. And I couldn't resist using this one as my startup slide. Uh, so I guess that's all I wanted to say as an introduction, other than I, I promised to say why I got interested. Well, there were two things that converged, actually. One was Dan Golden. Uh, are much maligned, but I think sort of the Harry Truman of NASA administrators. Uh, he gave a talk in 1998 at AGU about exoplanets. And it was like a lot of Dan's sort of wacky ideas. Everybody said, oh, well, you know, this isn't going anywhere. Uh, wrong. So Dan really nailed it. And at the same time, I was bailing into a project called Triana, which those of you who know anything about history have heard of. It's now mutated into the Discover mission. But I inserted a goal into the Triana goals to look at Earth as an exoplanet, because Triana was going out to the L1 point, which is way beyond the moon. It's four times farther than the moon. And so you see the Earth as a whole planet. And we actually had an instrument with a single pixel. You, you looked at the Earth in a single pixel, the way we have to do for exoplanets. Uh, we can't really resolve exoplanets yet. That's coming in 10 years, so hang on. Uh, I didn't want to get to the end and, sh and risk not showing this. The uh, folks up at MIT, Sarah Seeger and uh, some folks at Draper Lab, are putting together a CubeSat. It's a three three CubeSats bolted together called ExoplanetSat. They're planning on building quite a few of them. And this is part of a, a big movement here at Goddard towards small sats, which you may be hearing more about in the future. Um, in particular, there's a CubeSat you know, group here that meets fairly regularly that I meet with. And so they're able to do things on CubeSats now you can't even imagine. I mean, they basically have an imaging system and a pointing system, because they have to point it to star quite accurately on this thing that is just mind-boggling. So just a little advertisement for CubeSats and ExoplanetSat. There's a movie about these things on the web. Now, if you're an exoplanet junkie, this is where you go. You want to get the latest count. It changes every day. This is already obsolete. This is from, who knows, a couple weeks ago. But now there's 41,000 exoplanets, you see. But 
Most of them are candidates. They're not confirmed yet. So we'll see what it takes to get confirmed a little later. There's actually 865 confirmed uh, right now. So that's still quite a dramatic total considering in 1995 there was one. Uh, there was a special section in science which you probably noticed because of the cover. They put the five planet system Kepler-62 on the cover uh, at the bottom. At the top is I think a familiar solar system. Uh, there are two planets in the habitable zone, which we'll explain in a second, but I don't even need to wait. The habitable zone is where the, we think a planet has a surface temperature between 0 centigrade and 100 centigrade, so liquid water can exist on the surface. That's the habitable zone. It's defined actually in the 1970s by a guy named Michael Hart and really perfected by a guy named Jim Casting up at Penn State. Um, <clears throat> this particular system is 1,200 light years away. It'll take a while to get there. This is the first planet around another sun and the two discoverers you see up there. A uh, Swiss team from Geneva University who still are quite dominant in, in this field. They discovered this planet 51 Pegasi B. Now 51 Pegasi is the star name and B is the planet letter. That's how these things go. But it gets a little confusing because if you have a, a double star system, you, the star gets an A and a B, capital A and a capital B. Is that right, Jeremy? Yes. And then the little a, little b's are for the planets. So, you know, now you know the code. And if you see a word in front of the star name like Gliese, it's actually somebody's name, an astronomer, presumably. So stars are, believe it or not, well characterized compared to planets. They're, of course, one of the main ways they're characterized is the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, which classifies stars as uh, they plot their luminosity versus their, uh, versus their, well, this is star class on the bottom. Our sun is a G-class star. But this is really luminosity here. So these are very low luminosity stars. These are very hot luminosity stars that burn out in a few million or 100 million years. Uh, our sun is going to last 10 billion years or so. So we're on the main sequence here. And, you know, the stars off the main sequence, they're felt to be well understood also. By the way, our sun is a dwarf star. Uh, that's just the way astronomers classify it, so get used to it. The only new addition since 1916 is these brown dwarfs. There are three class of, classes of brown dwarfs, L, T, and Y. They're all very dim. Uh, there may be a lot of them out there. And a lot of people who study exoplanets like to study brown dwarfs because they don't have a nearby star to block out, you know, to dazzle you with their starlight. So in, in some ways they resemble giant Jupiters, so they're interesting to study. Uh, exoplanet detection methods. I was joking with Charles I was going to go through all these equations with you, but actually I'm not. It's just a cute graphic. There are a number of methods. Uh, they all are well... Um, grounded in physics, and these are the methods we'll go over. The radial velocity method, which is you just look at the star wobbling, and you look at the Doppler effect in the spectrum. Transit, that's the easiest one. The planet crosses the star. Microlensing, this is one of those Einstein gravitational effects where a background star is lensed by the planet, and you get a focusing effect. Direct imaging, that's pretty easy. Beer, have a glass of beer and you'll think you see a planet. <laughs> and astrometric, no one's found that yet. That's the, instead of a wobble to and from you, that's a back and forth wobble. And no one has been able to resolve that yet. Because you don't get the nice Doppler effect. Or you get a transverse Doppler, which is really hard to see. So, let's plunge in. Radial velocity method. It was the first method for sun-like stars, as we saw those happy guys found the first one in 1995. They've discovered about 500 exoplanets. Although now I should mention that their job they consider mainly to confirm the Kepler planets. Kepler is the mission that looks for transits, okay? So they 
consider that you know they don't want to just go randomly looking out in the galaxy you know for planets they want to study the Kepler candidates which is a lot more productive so but at the beginning until Kepler came along <coughs> and you know anyway they they just look out at productive regions they do need, uh, n they don't need a space telescope, that's kind of handy, they have these giant facilities on the ground. They do need a really sensitive spectrometer, as you might imagine, because they're looking for teeny little Doppler shifts. And they need about a thousand observations of one star. Now, to get an idea of how little these wobbles are, they're back and forth wobbles, they're like 12 meters a second for Jupiter, if you were going to look at Jupiter, and 1.1 meter per second for Earth. Uh, the best they can do is 0.5 meters per second. So, as we like to joke in the exoplanet community, we're, we're safe if the other guys don't have technology any better than ours. They haven't found us yet. And a couple of groups dominate. I'm going to show you the HARPS facility in Chile. Uh, there are just zillions of astronomical telescopes in Chile. I know my alumni association offers a tour where you can spend two weeks just touring the Chilean astronomical facilities. It's totally amazing what's down there. Uh, and they're huge. Uh, you wouldn't believe. Anyway, the HARPS is actually not the telescope. It's the instrument they put on the telescope. It's obviously a spectrometer that can look for Doppler shift. So, um, now, I've got a movie of the radial velocity method, so I'm just going to play it. You just basically are supposed to notice that the spectrum at the bottom wiggles back and forth as the planet and the star revolve around their common center of mass, which is, of course, usually inside the star. But nevertheless, the spectrum just moves back and forth, and uh, spectroscopy is so amazing that we can actually see that kind of stuff. So Now here is an iconic plot <clears throat> from the early days of the radial velocity method. You, you see uh, very noisy data. Uh, you see a scale of radial velocity from 100 meters per second down to minus 100 meters per second, although the real scale is about 50 to minus 50. So this is a big planet. Remember, Jupiter was only 12, so this is a super Jupiter. Uh, and you see, nevertheless, the signal just jumps right out at you. And the, uh, the period, uh, the time between two peaks, is the length of the planet year, which for the early planets were actually very short, like a few days. You know, the planet was just whipping around its star. Uh, we've found others since then that don't quite move so fast. Here's another one, and you see a few of the data points. Remember we said you maybe need a thousand data points to really nail this, but here, uh, you know, no one astronomer gets complete control of a telescope, you know, for years, so you just take your time when you can get it. So here's a planet that was orbiting 79 Ceti. It's about a a two-thirds of Saturn's mass. Uh, it had an orbital period of 75 days, so we're already way up from the few days that were seen at the beginning. Data points are in yellow, and uh, now we got minus 10 to 10 meters per second, so we can detect Jupiters at this point. Uh, and we did detect a Saturn-sized planet, so uh, that's how it's done. Of course, if I stripped away the underlying curve and you were just looking at the yellow points, you might say, ooh, what's that? You know, it doesn't look like anything. So. Yeah, you have to have a, a really good, uh, a lot of data points and a good imagination, I guess. So, a lot of hot Jupiters were discovered. Uh, but later, the Kepler mission showed that these are rare. And this was fortunate because planetary dynamicists just about fell on the floor of frost at the mouth when they heard about hot Jupiters because they don't fit into the theories of planet formation which go all the way back to Laplace. And so, just hot off the press, you know, you heard it here first. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we got the news that these hot Jupiters are not actually doing a death dive into their stars. That they, their orbits, they are diving for a while, but after a while, the, their orbits circularize, and they actually can be stable around their host star for billions of years once they circularize. And of course, what circularizes their orbit is tidal forces and all the stuff that you learned in Newtonian mechanics. So 
This is important because it was also rather weird that we would even see hot Jupiters. I mean, if they're doing a death dive into their star and you think of the age of the galaxy, you know, why should we even see them? So apparently this is why we see them. They're actually stable, weird though they are. The transit method, artist's idea of the transit method. Uh, the Kepler mission has been the most productive method for transits. Uh, that's a picture of the Kepler satellite. Uh, it's amazing. It just looks at a part of the sky and it doesn't necessarily look at close stars. So it just picked a region of the sky which was fairly productive, they thought, but the stars are actually quite far away. Um, and I'm not going to give you a bunch of light years because you know, only Jeremy here will understand how far a light year really is. But, you know. Anyway, we want to look for closer planets, so we're going to launch TESS, which is the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite in like 2019. And TESS will look at actually close stars. So we're going to, it's going to look for Earths and super-Earths around close stars, and that's wonderful. And that'll kind of play with the, the Webb telescope in the sense that if TESS spots something big enough that the Webb can see it, and the web will turn its giant attention to that particular star and planet. So we might actually get a spectrum, because the web takes spectra in the near infrared, and the, that's very useful for seeing things like water, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, you know, methane. So, you know, th this would be a very cool combination, and we're hoping to make this work. Goddard has a role in TESS, by the way. We're the project managers for that, and we expect to have a science role. Um, Another movie. Okay, here we go. Just 20 seconds of just amazing dips. And of course, it's not just a heavy side function. There's a finite time of entry into the star and a finite time leaving the star. And that's when you can get information about the atmosphere, for example. Uh, so there's information all through that curve. And so there's a lot of people who are looking at these curves and trying to learn as much as they can about the exoplanets. So that's, that's a transit curve. Now the dip in brightness can be, you know, tenths or I guess hundredths of a percent even. I mean, the photometry that can be done from space is absolutely amazing. So uh, that's why we're able to find like Earth-sized planets. You need to see the orbit edge on. This is kind of limiting. It's pretty obvious, right? Well, it turns out people have estimated about only 5% of stars meet this requirement. Uh, so that means that we're missing 95% with the transit method. But it's amazingly sensitive to slight dimming, which I said now, you know, I'm, I was joking at the beginning, you could join Planet Hunters. It's actually true. There's a website, planethunters.org, where you can look at Kepler light curves and you can, you know, if you see, think you see a planet, you can, you know, poke a button and say, I see a planet. And they actually have, the planet hunters have found several planets. So it isn't just the professional staff. There's just a lot of Kepler data and the, the team isn't big enough to look at all of it. So it's kind of a fun thing to do. I spent an afternoon uh, looking for planets, it was kind of fun. So there's two years of Kepler data left to analyze. Uh, they got the first confirmed planet, uh, which is Earth, sort of Earth-sized, roughly 2.4 times the radius of the Earth, Kepler 22b in the habitable zone. But Kepler died uh, after three and a half years. The second of the two reaction wheels died, so it's, it's dead. Um, here's habitable zone uh, plotted uh, here we, are, we have to get used to things like diagrams. Th these are very simple diagrams compared to what we d deal with in Earth science. So we got star mass relative to the sun. So here's the sun. We're a G-class star. Uh, these are the M dwarfs. They're much dimmer than the sun. Sometimes, you know, a 1% of the sun's luminosity or less. Uh, and there's a lot of them, like 75% of the stars roughly are these M dwarfs. Uh, here's distance in astronomical units. Earth is at one, so Earth is still at the center of the universe. Copernicus, go away, because we're still locking ourselves in one. See, one and one, there's Earth right here. So, uh, if 
The habitable zone includes planets that, gosh, it's hard to see, it's a purple line. Wow, it's about this wide, but it includes Earth and Mars. It does not include Venus. Venus is somewhat too far in for the habitable zone. Now, what happened to Venus may not be because it was, you know, too far in. I mean, Venus's catastrophe was, was really quite dramatic. Anyway, there's another curve here called the tidal lock radius. Now, Mercury here is inside that, which means that Mercury, it doesn't always face the sun. It's in what's called a three to two resonance, but basically Mercury is totally tidally locked to the sun. Now, for these M dwarf planets, a lot of them are so close to their star that they're probably tidally locked. And this is very depressing because if they're tidally locked, it means they're hot on one side and cold on the other. And there might only be a habitable region in between the light and the dark, you know, and the Terminator. So science fiction's been written about stuff like this. Anyway, there's a lot of those kind of planets. And, you know, whether they're habitable or not, I guess we have to define. Uh, this is uh, one of the systems around a red dwarf star called Lisa 581. There's quite a few planets there. Uh, just our own solar system for reference, but the Gliese 581 planets are, are really all very close to their red dwarf star, you know, it's E, B, C, G, D. Uh, there's, it's quite a full system. And I'll say what full means a little later. Now first, before I get too far, I want to say what made Earth habitable. Well, it wasn't just liquid water at the surface. I mean, there's a guy who's written a book called Rare Earth, and another book along the same lines that I've looked at that makes the point that Earth's habitability goes far beyond just having liquid water at the surface. We needed volcanoes, for example, to get us out of snowball Earth, among other nice things that volcanoes do for us. Uh, they recycle their carbon cycle. Near circular orbit, if you're too eccentric, it gets too hot, too cold, too often. Uh, we needed water to be delivered by comets, we think, because Earth probably was dry initially. Now, there could have been some water outgassed, and you can argue till you're blue in the face about how much water came from comets and how much was outgassed, but we're pretty sure a lot of water came from the early bombardment by comets, which brought ice from the outer solar system. Magnetic field to divert the solar wind, which might otherwise blow our atmosphere away, or at least parts of it. Plate tectonics to move the plates around. That seems to be an important part of life on Earth. Started about three billion years ago. Jupiter may have shielded us from, you know, asteroids and comets. We saw with Shoemaker-Levy in 1992 that Jupiter just sucked in this giant comet. If that guy had hit Earth, we would have been having a different conversation right now. Uh, and then it's nice to be around a quiet, long live star, not too close to the galaxy center. The galaxy center is a big black hole. And I'm tr still trying to find out what's inside that black hole, but it's not a nice place to be. You don't want to be too close to the black hole. There's a lot of radiation coming out. On the other hand, if you go too far out in the galaxy, there's not enough metal. Now, to an astronomer, a metal is anything other than hydrogen and helium. So. In the outer reaches, the outer spiral arms of our galaxy, there's just not enough metal, and so the planets there would probably be metal poor. And that's not good, because metals are important for life. And then some people say the moon has stabilized the tilt of the Earth, otherwise we might have flopped over the way we think Mars did at one point, and the way Uranus has flopped over. It's actually got a 90 degree tilt, you know, it sort of goes around the sun, rotating like this, you know, as it goes around. So. That's pretty weird. And it provides tides. Tides were regarded as, as important for developing life. That sort of fluctuation of the tides may have been important. And we're not tidally locked, which is good. So this is a relatively new discovery. Uh, rocky planets, I should have said, in the habitable zone. The habitable zone's green. Uh, GG, Gliese 667 C is a part of a triple star system. Uh, and that's kind of a surprise. We hadn't, we, we weren't really sure we'd find planets around double or triple stars, which are quite common. I mean, like, I think it's half the stars are binary. So here we go. We got planets around one of a uh, member of a triple star system. There's between five and seven, five for sure, seven maybe, 
So this is really a big system, kind of like ours. Uh, three super-Earths in the habitable zone. Uh, a super-Earth is something with a radius, uh, say, between 1.25 and 2 point something at the radius of the Earth, where you'd weigh somewhat more. Uh, the star has a third of the sun's mass, which means it's a lot less luminous, and I said it's a triple star. So this is one example. Here's a system GJ581, uh, and you can't read this, but I'm going to read it for you. So this sort of band here in the middle is the habitable zone, uh, and there's one planet here and one planet just there, which may be just in the habitable zone. Now that's the mass of the star divided by the mass of the sun. So there's the sun, of course. And so this star is about 0.3, just like the last one we saw. So it's 0.3 the mass of the sun, a lot less luminous. And here's your orbital distances. There's the Earth, right? You see our familiar solar system up here. Here's this system. They're orbiting much closer, uh, some of them closer than Mercury, because that's Mercury up there, and you see these planets are really close to their star and probably tidally locked. Now, the purple part says, this is a new piece of work. Again, you heard it here first. Clouds, which are a hot subject for us to study in this building, uh, may help to create extensions to the habitable zone. They actually may uh, make the, you know, habitable zone larger, which is good news. So more planets may fall into the habitable zone. Of course, this is really frontier work, but anyway, I thought you'd enjoy that. One thing, I remember I said Earth has a circular orbit. A lot of the planets we found, here's eccentricity, here's Earth, let me just circle it. Uh, Earth has an eccentricity of something like 0.0, that's 0.2. 0.4, 0.6, up to 1. You see these are huge eccentricities for an orbit. Earth has a very low eccentricity, nearly circular. It changes slightly, and that has an effect on ice ages, but uh, it's pretty mild. So <clears throat> how do we confirm and validate? Uh, well, first, you have to know that other things can make a star flicker. Sunspots, they're star spots, uh, an eclipsing binary. So you have to rule out these false positives. So there's two steps. Confirmation, you determine the planet's mass. Now, usually turn to your friends in the radial velocity community and say, please give me the mass. However, if you're lucky, when you have multiple planets, like in some of the systems I just showed you, the laws of motion themselves can allow you to, to back out the planetary masses, and you don't need the radial velocity guys. So. Validation is simply ruling out false positives, and this is very familiar to Earth science folks. They do this all the time. Um, val confirmation, validation with field campaigns, etc. So Kepler scientists claim they need three properly timed transits before a planet can pass. However, I found a graph where they allowed only two, and I already said that Kepler died at 3.5. Here's a star spot. I just thought you should see one. Uh, it's amazing. Of course, we don't really have a, a photo of the star, but we know from this little uh, rise here, this little mountain, that the planet actually covered a star spot. You know, star spots are colder than the star, so if you cover it, the star will look hotter. And the planet is not hot itself, I guess, in this case. So anyway, that's a star spot. If you're an amateur astronomer, you can do some of this yourself. This is the M Earth Survey in Arizona. They look for planets around those tiny stars, the M dwarfs. Uh, and in 2009, they got their first super Earth. So yay for the uh, Earth telescopes. And they don't need to be the Chilean size. Um, the early finds were big. The transit method and, the, of course, radio velocity method found really humongous planets. They're, you know, we didn't know what to expect out there, but there are some really big planets. They're almost like stars. You know, they're, in fact, the difference between brown dwarfs, which are very small stars that don't actually burn hydrogen, and these huge super Jupiters, that, you know, the, the difference has been blurred as a result of these discoveries. So th this isn't the current situation. I just wanted to show you. This was such a, a nice picture, I had to show it. But anyway, here's the temperature of the planet, okay? And here's water boils, water freezes, that's where we are. Uh, Jupiter and Neptune are kind of cold. 
Uh, you see lead melts up here, here, and Venus is so hot on the surface that lead melts. Mercury is pretty hot, and these guys are really hot. We're talking 2,000 Kelvin, where gold melts, iron melts. The early, and you see the early numbers: six, seven, five, and so forth. Eight. There's four B. These guys are really hot. They're either you know close to their stars or whatever. But anyway. Uh, we're way past that now. This is the current curve. This is hot off the press. And you notice only, they only require two or more transits for this. So I think that's, that's good. You know, they're relaxing their standards because, you know, Earth is here. This is orbital period in days. We got 365. It would be about here. And so you see, if you require three transits and your mission dies in three and a half years, it's really hard to pick up an Earth, you know. Whereas if you only allow two transits, you have a better shot at it. Now this diagram is easier to understand than it might look. The colors are just by year, okay. The blue dots were the earliest discoveries right after Kepler was launched. And that, uh, 2010, 2011, those are all at large radius relative to Earth. Here's Earth radius 1. 4, 10, 20. So you can see the blue dots tend to cluster up there. 2012, you see the red dots are coming down. They're between 1 and 4 Earth radii. And then 2013 discoveries already this year, huge numbers, are clustering way down here between 1 and 4 and pretty much below 2, 2 to 3 Earth masses, I mean Earth radii. So that was really an amazing bag catch. The sizes of these candidates, uh, and of course you get the size when it goes across the star, you don't get the mass necessarily. Uh, and this is just since February 2012, how things have changed. So these numbers in yellow indicate that we're actually, we're seeing, you know, a little bit more of the big guys, the super Jupiters larger than 15 Earth radii. Uh, Jupiter size, we actually saw a decrease, maybe some of them fell off because they didn't get validated. We're seeing a big increase in Neptune and super Earth sized planets, and the biggest increase was in Earth size. So, this is really exciting. Um, and this actually, a lot of people believe this curve actually just goes up that once we start to get really tens of thousands of planets, they're going to be just lots and lots of Earth sized planets. I had a curve like that, but I think it's actually kind of somebody's fantasy, so I didn't show it. This is actually real data. And we can see the number of Earth-sized planets below 1.25 Earth radii really coming on strongly. And then the super earth size, because we have nothing like that in our solar system. And we don't have any of these, well, there's kind of these mini Neptunes, you know, that kind of fall in here. We don't have any of those either. So we're seeing new kinds of planets, a lot of new kinds, in fact. Uh, so this is another... Uh, cut at the Kepler data, that's a fraction of stars with greater than or equal to one planet. Uh, you see that there's a belief that about 17 percent of the stars have an Earth-sized planet, 1.8 to 1.25 Earth radius. Uh, and super-Earths are even more common, and then the mini-Neptunes are just as common, around 20 percent. And then there's actually quite rare to find gas giants and large Neptunes, so that's that's the way it stacks up today. What do we know from Kepler? I'm just going to give you kind of the, you know, the uh, Twitter feed from Kepler. We know there's apparently about 17 billion Earth-sized planets in our galaxy. One-sixth of stars have one, maybe more. We know that for any planet except the gas giants, uh, any star is okay. In other words, Earths and super-Earths are not picky. I'm quoting actually one of the planetary scientists who said that. So. Uh, we, we don't need to be around a sun-like star to find an Earth or a super-Earth. Seventy percent of stars have planets. I think before the dust settles, it's going to be higher than that. Fifty percent, which are the red dwarfs, have a closely orbiting planet. And then the frequency of planets increases as the size decreases. We saw that curve starting to t take shape. Um, and it's going to get more like that. So the thing is, the first thing that, of course, all of us wanted to know is as planets get bigger than the Earth, when do they stop being like rocky, sort of like something we might recognize? Well, it's about the two times Earth radius. Once a planet gets that big, remember that would be eight times the Earth's volume, 
it's got enough gravity that it can really suck in a lot of hydrogen and helium. And so there's a belief uh, that of the, of many of these larger planets that may be fallen in the mini Neptune class, they have a thick hydrogen helium atmosphere. And they may have water and other stuff, but it's really very different than our own atmosphere. And good news is they believe aquaplanets may abound. Now, those of you who do modeling, climate modeling, know that aquaplanets are a very popular topic. And so uh, in the past, we didn't know what the target was of those modeling exercises. Now we do. There are a lot of aquaplanets out there. So here's the uh, latest results from Fresen up at Harvard Smithsonian. Uh, the planets per star with a period less than 85 days. And so here you see, you know, kind of like the same numbers we were looking at before. 16% Earth's, 17, 18% super Earth's, 19% mini Neptunes, and then it really scales off as you go to larger planets. So these big, uh, super hot Jupiters are quite rare. So. Now, how do we learn about exoplanet atmospheres? This gets down to something everyone here should be interested in. There's three different ways, actually. There's not just the transit, where you can learn something about the composition through the uh, spectrum of absorbed starlight that's passing through the atmosphere, especially when it's coming in and out of the, the transit. That's a really valuable time. You can also look at what's called the secondary eclipse, where you can get information in the IR spectrum. If you happen to have an infrared spectrometer, you can look at composition because you can look at emission lines and then you can look at just temperature. I mean, the IR spectrum tells you something about temperature and even temperature profile. You can begin to do some of the stuff that we do in Building 33 where you get temperature profiles from limb scanning. So until you hit a cloud, then you're, you're dead. Uh, and then finally, the variations, if you can actually watch the planet go around, this is the holy grail, you can look at day-night temperature differences. And especially if it's tidally locked, you're going to see big day-night temperature differences. So there's quite a bit to learn. Microlensing, this is uh, an observatory in New Zealand where they discovered the first rogue planet. Now, we'll have a bit more to say about rogue planets in a minute. Uh, and Microlensing, you can get both mass and the distance from the star. This is great. You can get planets much smaller than Earth. You only get one shot, uh, and that's it. You get your time in the telescope, and that's it. So they've got 17 so far. Not impressive, but you know, it's, it's another way of looking at the uh, elephant in the room. Direct imaging, this is Sphere in Chile. Uh, you can't believe the size of these things. You wouldn't, couldn't even see a human being, I think, on that picture at the bottom. Uh, direct imaging, they can detect planets maybe t uh, 10 to the minus 6 as bright as their star. They use adaptive optics and wavefront control. This is the latest sort of thing in optics. Now, they've only found 12 so far, and of course these are large and they're far from their star. You know, the smallest was four or five times the mass of Jupiter out of 76 AU, which is like 76 times the distance of Earth from the sun, you know, so. Uh, anyway, they're going to mainly focus on large, young, hot planets in the infrared because planets are hot when they first form, so. Here's one of the first images of a planet, B, there around a star, capital A. Uh, they knew the planet was there beforehand from probably radial velocity, but this provided confirmation. So that's, that's another iconic picture in the exoplanet world. Here's the solar system viewed from 32 light years away. Uh, the sun curve up there, here's Jupiter. This is just the wavelength here from 0.1 micron out to 1,000 microns. Very familiar to our scientists, the amount of flux. So we got Jupiter in the purple curve and Earth in sort of the blue curve there. And what you see is that you need, you know, 10 to the 10th uh, discrimination between the host star, in this case the sun, and the Earth in the optical. In the infrared, you need three orders of magnitude less, so that's really handy. So infrared is a good place to look uh, when you're starting, especially. Now, I'm not going to say anything about the beer method. It is actually a real method, but it just takes two months explanation, so you can get my slides. They did bag Kepler 76b, so yay for the beer guys. 
uh, the Webb Telescope, Spectra of Transiting Planets, Imaging Jupiters. This is what we expect to get out of Webb. Now, you, you can't expect too much out of Webb because Webb was designed when we weren't, we didn't know really how many exoplanets there were. So, you know, even if we did, they might not have changed their goals. Nevertheless, uh, they will do some stuff with exoplanets, and we're all excited about that. The Zoo of Exoplanets. Here's, this is a very complicated plot, unlike my others, because it's got the results of all the different methods, uh, at least up to a certain year, which I think would be 2012. Um, now you have Earth masses, so there's Earth, okay, and there's Venus nearby. And then you have the semi-major axis in AU, which, so there's Earth, which is one, okay. So these are log scales. So here's, you know, Mars, Mercury, so our familiar planets. Now these are the ones discovered by radial velocity. You see they're all up there, they have large masses. Uh, the transit methods are in green, so you see they have very small radii, you know, below 0.1 AU. So, you know, they're easier to find. And then microlensing and direct imaging, so they're kind of all over the map. So we're starting to fill in this plot and eventually, who knows, it may just become a giant blob of points once we have 10,000. There's a GI or GJ, is that G, G, G anyway. Gee, something, huh? Gliese. Gliese 581. So it's an M star. Uh, it's got, as a result of these transit curves that you see, oh no, these are radial velocity curves. Anyway, as a result of these curves, they were able to, you know, tease out the masses of, and the radii of these planets. So one of them is two times the mass of the Earth. Another one is uh, five mass of the Earth, seven mass of the Earth, and 15. So there's four planets, all of which uh, are quite interesting. This one, 1.94 mass of the Earth, seems to be very light, a low density planet. So it may have a lot of hydrogen and helium. Um, so here's one of the most bizarre possibilities, a diamond planet, uh, 55 Cancri E. This was like a super Earth, two times the radius of Earth. Uh, there are five planets in the system and it orbits a star in only 18 hours. It's really whipping along. Uh, it has a graphite surface, as near as they can tell, from spectra. And its bizarre nature is actually governed by something called the C to O ratio. So uh, in our solar system, there's one C for two O's, okay? So the C to O ratio is like a half. Uh, there are other solar systems, though, where we can measure the C to O ratio, at least on the sun, and it's more like one. And believe it or not, in those systems, you're more likely to form a carbon planet made of carbide than you are a silicate planet, which is like Earth, if you're going to make you know, a solid planet, not just a gas ball. So these are quite amazing planets, but I have to move on. Alpha Centauri, our nearest star. It's actually a double star, maybe a triple star. If Proxima is ever uh, going to join the, the group, it could be a triple star. About the size of our sun, uh, and it has an Earth-sized planet, just discovered in October 2012. So that's pretty exciting. It's very close to a star, not in the habitable zone. Six million kilometers compared to Earth's 150 million kilometers. So it is hot. Uh, this is the highest precision. Remember I mentioned Doppler method could get half a meter a second? This, this is the one. So, <clears throat> rogue planets. Imagine my astonishment when I opened the Weather Armageddon uh, issue of TV Week and I saw the Weather Channel was doing a special on rogue planets. And they said, these planets careen through space, not fixed to any solar system. Advances in technology enabled scientists to discover 200 billion of them. And just one of these, not even hitting the Earth, but entering the solar system would perturb the orbits of the planets in ways that would have dismal results. So naturally I had to watch this half hour <laughs> drill, you know. But it, it was fun. Anyway, there's a lot of these rogue planets. They've discovered one 100 light years away. Uh, it's got, oh boy, there's an unpronounceable name for him. Uh, it was found by ground-based telescopes, four to seven Jupiter masses, and it's 430 degrees centigrade. So what's going on there? Why isn't it cold? 
You know, some people are even speculating life could travel around the galaxy on these rogue planets, you know, because they're still warm from the time of their formation. Uh, this one is young. It's in a star cluster that's quite young. Was it booted out by planetary dynamics? Is it a failed brown dwarf? Who knows? Anyway, there may be more than 200 million rogues. That's the thinking now. Planet formation. I, I, there's big globs of gas and dust in our galaxy, and they just love to get together and form stars and planets. So the dust is only about 1%. Sorry for you aerosol guys. The gas is about 99%. However, the dust plays a really crucial role. Uh, and then this, as the star ignites, uh, what's happened is that what's, what happens is there's something called the snow line, which is a lovely phrase. Uh, past the snow line, uh, the gases like CO2 and H2O can condense into little tiny particles, micron-sized particles. And so that's the, it actually does snow as, as the planet system is forming. Uh, and of course, the rocky planets then don't get any snow. Sad to say, and unlike today, uh, they, all that stuff that we like gets blown out of the inner solar system. It's just the solar winds plus it's too hot. You know, they can't condense there. So those ices that condense out there form the giant planets. And then there's lots of gas, too. And then we're, we're called rubble, by the way. The, there's this joke in the exoplanet community that the alien astronomers, when they look at our system, they say there are four planets. Uh, you know, Jupiter's the inmost, and Uranus is the outermost. And inwards of Jupiter, there's rocky rubble. And outwards from Neptune, there's icy rubble. So welcome to living on rubble. This just gives you an idea where stuff condenses as you get, I mean, it's hot close to the sun. This is optically thick, remember, when the planet, planets first form. This is not some optically thin, you know vague, you know, haze that you can see 150 miles through. This is thick, so it's hot. And so the metals, the silicates, all, this is distance from the sun in AU. So here's the Earth right about here. And so metals and silicates condense, but you have to go farther out. Here's Jupiter at 5, uh, Saturn around 10. And so Jupiter and Saturn get the water ice and the ammonia and the other good stuff that we, we want. Uh, Laplace and Immanuel Kant, although he just speculated vaguely, but Laplace really formed the first nebular hypothesis about how planets form. What's changed since then? Well, planet, we now know planetary systems have become dynamically full. They can't hold more planets. In fact, our system seems to be full. If you added another planet, it would get kicked out eventually. Um, and they could become those rogue planets. And then planets migrate after they're formed. We thought they just formed in place and stayed there. Uh, and then there's a new array in Chile called ALMA to see these so-called protoplanetary nebulae while they're forming planets. It's just delightful. Here's one stage, of one guy's idea of planet migration. You know, that Jupiter maybe didn't migrate all that much, but that, you know, uh, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune migrated outwards, and that this may have kicked off the late heavy bombardment of Earth. That they disturbed the giant cloud of junk, you know, icy rubble out there, and tossed some of it towards Earth to cause something called the late heavy bombardment. So that's the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. It's absolutely amazing. They can put these things up to 15 kilometers apart, and they're millimeter radars, something we're very familiar with here in Earth science. So. Uh, and they, they can't look at planets, really. The wavelength is too long, and the resolution isn't quite what it needs to be to look at that. But they can look at a protoplanetary disk. And what they found, their first discovery, so they, again, you heard it here first, uh, just, they just opened for business in March, and they announced just last month that they'd found <clears throat> something called a dust trap around a planet, excuse me, around a star. And the dust trap was a cashew shape. Uh, what's interesting about this is if you go back to Laplace, well, his theory stood for about 100 years. And then Maxwell came along and said, it's just a load of bunk because planets can't form the way Laplace said. Laplace said that there are rings of dust and gas, OK, uh, that just clump together by gravitation and form planets. But Maxwell said, no, the inner ring 
the inner part of the ring is moving faster than the outer part, so they can't get together. And if you actually have a dust trap like this, that solves the problem. It essentially answers Maxwell, so that's very cool. Then, for those of you that love clouds, it turns out when you read about planet formation, it's very much like clouds. I mean, you start with grains of a few microns that flash out uh, when it gets cool enough. Uh, they can be rocks or ice, depending on where you are. Then they grow by collision and coalescence, sure enough. Maybe in these dust traps that we're seeing. The bigger ones are, I love that, called oligarchs. They scavenge the smaller guys, so this sounds like rain, huh? Uh, or hail. And then when the planetesimals reach one kilometer, gravity kicks in. So they start to you know, really attract each other. And just as raindrops begin to feel gravity. So you know, all in all, I'm just impressed at how we often, in the early days of cloud physics, you may not know, but it was kind of a mystery why clouds rain so fast. You know, it would take 20 minutes, and the theory said 40 minutes. So uh, it also happens fast in planetary systems. Uh, all this stuff getting together to form these big oligarchs and stuff happens in a few million years sometimes. So that's pretty exciting. Now, we're getting at the end of the talk, and so let's talk about getting to our nearest neighbors. Uh, we have the sun, we have the Oort cloud, which is this gigantic cloud of, some people say, trillions of comets and junk left over from the solar system formation that's about one and a half light years out. Uh, so at four light years is our closest star, Proxima Centauri, and then Alpha Centauri is very close to that. Uh, then there's Barnard Star over there, and then finally we have a couple of brown dwarfs that were recently discovered at six light years. So that's our neighborhood. You might as well get to know it. Uh, and there was brown dwarfs who only discovered this year, so that's pretty cool. Now, getting to exoplanets. The Star Wars method, which you've seen when you see uh, Harrison Ford jump to light speed, you see this blur of light come by you. Well, it turns out it's not like that. Some students took a look at this, and they said, no, it wouldn't look like that at all. If you're going that fast, and of course you can't actually go to speed of light, but you can go 99.9%. .9 if you were going that fast, those, that starlight <coughs> would be Doppler shifted into the X-ray region. You would be bathed in X-rays. And this is what it would really look like. You would see the cosmic microwave background Doppler shifted to the visible. So it would be like sort of the movies where you go to heaven, you know, you see the big white light. <laughs> this is actually what it should look like. So I think the Star Wars guys should get their act together. <laughs> a multi-generational starship. Well, of course, everyone's been thinking about this for a long time. But now that we found there's a lot of junk out there, they're redesigning the starships to have a very small cross-section <laughs> so we don't hit anything. This starship is smaller than a GCM grid square. It's only two kilometers by two kilometers. It, it shows very little area in its direction of travel. So, you know, of course, if you're going to hit a rogue planet, you know, that's another matter entirely. But anyway, it, it rotates so you get gravity. It can hold a million people, and it would take about 10,000 years to reach uh, the star Iridiani. So, that's that. And I'm going to finish with. This is really hot off the press. There's been a new planet discovered just a few days ago. So I really wanted to bring this to you. That's it. <laughs> That's yeah, we'll take a few comments uh, before we allow him to go to the next talk. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. So you had a, a, a list of qualities which may be important for life, and most of them were fairly straightforward. 
One of them you mentioned was the tilt of the planet. Why, why should it be that the tilt is that significant? And what would be the most extreme tilt that is reasonable? Well, you know, because tilt gives us seasons. If we were pointed vertically relative to the orbit plane, then we wouldn't have seasons. So some people think seasons are important for developing life. Uh, the main thing with tilt is you don't want to tilt too far. Tilting back towards zero tilt would be okay. I, I can imagine a planet with life with a lot with zero tilt. 90 degree tilt is a disaster. And as I said, they think Mars had a 90 degree tilt at one time. Now they're backing off on that and I think saying maybe 60 degrees. But basically, the moon has kind of stabilized the tilt of the Earth, so that's been good for us. Uh, if you're, you know, 90 degrees, then you get six months of summer and six months of winter, you know, as you go around your sun. That, that would definitely be very unpleasant. Dismal, even. So it might depend also on how eccentric the orbit is instead of what kind of seasonal you could tolerate. Yeah. That was the Weather Channel's point about rogue planets, so it might increase the eccentricity of Earth's orbit, and that wouldn't be good for us. Yeah. Good yeah. So a couple points. One is, if you have an atmosphere, it can, depending on the circulation, it can actually distribute the heat so that even if it's tilted in a fairly extreme way, it can still regularize the temperature at the surface. So that was one thing. Um, I had a question on one of your slides where you showed what was discovered recently versus what was discovered in the past. And I, I was not surprised that smaller planets were discovered more recently. Right. Yeah, what surprised me was that <coughs> some of the larger planets, there weren't very many new discoveries of larger planets. And that surprised me. Is there a reason why they're not finding larger planets anymore? Have they just found them all already? Yeah, it's good news. I mean, for the planetary dynamicists, they didn't want to find any more large planets, you know, because they really blew their theories all to hell. So, so how much of that was wishful thinking? How much of that was wishful thinking? Yeah, well, you know, when they first found those large planets, they were very disturbed. And so as Kepler began to find more and more small planets, they heaved a sigh of relief. They're actually happy about that. What was your first point? Oh, it was about tidally locked planets? Yeah, there's actually people running GCM simulations of tidally locked planets. We just saw them out at a meeting in Annapolis on exoplanets, and uh, they're fascinating. I mean, if you get enough of an atmosphere, you can get a circulation from the hot side around to the cold side. And, you know, the guy Adam Showman actually showed how there was a, a terminator region where life would be possible, liquid water would form. You get ice on one side, kind of a little bit hot on the other side and about a thousand kilometers of Terminator where you could actually live, so. And sort of one last point, which is that this idea that certain things preclude life is very narrow thinking in my opinion anyway. I mean, even the GCMs that represent Earth at this point have uncertainties in them. Imagine the uncertainties in planets for which we've never actually seen more than a spot of light. So I think there's probably a lot more room for possibilities than that. I know you probably agree with that point. Guess what the two words I hear often in the exoplanet community are? Clouds and aerosols. <laughs> Sometimes they call aerosols haze, though, so you have to get ready for that. Photochemical haze, like on Titan. But they're basically expecting clouds and aerosols are going to totally mess up things just the way they do on Earth. Uh, and so that, that's yet to be learned. They have found clouds on brown dwarfs, though, because, you know, they've actually seen three-dimensional, you know, changes in the brown dwarf they ascribe to clouds. It's amazing. Okay, last question. Yep. Are you talking about candidates versus confirmed exoplanets? Could you talk about candidates that are unconfirmed? Like, what's the percentage of that versus confirmed? Oh, well, there's like two-thirds of them are unconfirmed. And How often are they rejected? Only about 5% are rejected. It, they're, Kepler's pretty good. So yeah, they, they're, they're pretty rigorous to even put something in as a candidate. Although you saw they slipped from three orbits to two, so I, <laughs> maybe they're getting more lax in their old age. Who knows? Okay, 
Oh, she, she had a sad son. Okay, yeah. uh, go ahead. The dust trap that you showed? Yeah. Um, <coughs> do we know why it's shaped like that or how that might affect planet formation? Well, we know that if the dust trap exists, it's kind of a vortex of some kind. And now they've done simulations that say that vortex could last millions of years, which is plenty of time for planets to form. And so once you see something, you can find a way to simulate it. But before they saw it, they really had no idea such things existed. So it could be these are common. And ALMA, as it continues to do its thing, may find a lot more of these dust traps. And, and that's good news for planet formation, because otherwise, how would planets be there? You know, it's kind of a mystery. Anyway, it's... Uh, okay, so let's thank one, one more time.